Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. Well, Professor Margaret Heffernan is an entrepreneur, CEO and author. And her motto is, let's not play the game, let's change it. Margaret published her most recent book about succeeding in a world of uncertainty just before the COVID-19 pandemic took hold in Ireland. Margaret, we'll be discussing your latest book, Uncharted, How to Map the Future Together. But first, I'd like to get an insight into the professional path which you followed. So I spent the first 13 years of my life working as a producer for BBC Radio and then television. And then I ran a, a trade association for film and television producers. Then I moved to the United States where I ran tech companies for 10 years. And then I moved back to the UK in 2002. And since then, I've been writing um, books and articles and have now published six books, of which Uncharted is the most recent. And I also know that through your work with the Design and Arts Copyright Society, you're very passionate about protecting the livelihoods of artists, especially from a royalties perspective. Well, at that, part of what we do is we work on behalf of artists to uh, track down copyright infringement and to enforce the law so that artists are paid what the law requires for their work or for reproduction of their work. And we also enforce something called artist resale right, which means that an artist gets um, a royalty, if you like, when any time their work is sold on. And increasingly, we're developing new systems and processes to ensure that it's harder and harder to counterfeit or just copy the work, which people have really spent their lives learning how to create. Um, I mean, this has been a terrible, terrible time, especially for visual artists and designers. You know, most of the casual work on which they often depend, especially at the beginning of their career, has absolutely vanished. Um, You know, they can't afford to rent studios, they don't have materials, they don't have models, they don't have assistants, you know, they can't work with others. And so we are doing absolutely everything we can think of to use this period to find ways to make the life of designers and artists more sustainable and to ensure that they are paid properly for their work. In 2011, your book, Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Pearl, won critical acclaim. But what was the key message that you wanted to convey through this book? The key message was that, you know, we often look away from problems that we really don't want to address. And we do that because it's much easier for us. And we sometimes think, oh, well, you know, don't walk the boat. But the truth is, every time we do that, the boat actually gets rockier problems grow worse, uh, risks increase, and opportunities for improvement or for addressing problems um, become harder and harder to find. And I think, you know, strangely, we've seen this week that, of course, you know, ignoring the issue of what was happening to babies in particular in Ireland, you know, which many, many people I know turned a blind eye to for years, That simply allowed this terrible tragedy to go on for more years. Uh, Exactly the same thing with the, which I've written about in Willful Blindness specifically, about the sexual abuse of children by priests. And although turning a blind eye, it makes for a quieter life, it makes for a much worse life. So the central argument is the earlier we draw attention to these things that make us uncomfortable, the easier it is to fix them. It's a fair point. Now, in a business context, do you believe that willful blindness is prevalent in everyday life today? And if so, how can it really be addressed? Well, I think it is is everywhere, Um, you know, not with malign intent necessarily, but because we have too much to think about, we're too busy, we're often at work trying really hard to please our bosses, so we don't want to have an argument about something which we think, you know, either might not be very good or could be better. So we do quite a lot for a, for a quiet life. And so a lot of my book looks at, you know, how do, we, how do we address this problem? How can companies create environments where it's easier to speak up about problems or opportunities? And, you know, some of this is physical, which is that if you work people 50, 60 hours a day, they will develop tunnel vision. They'll be so tired that they actually can't see what's often staring them in the face. So... It's partly about behavior, it's partly about corporate culture, and some of it simply comes down to making sure that the people around you 
are able to use their very good brains and they're not too exhausted or too frightened to do so. Now, this leads us on to your latest book, Uncharted, which examines the people and organisations that are not daunted by uncertainty. 2020 was the embodiment of uncertainty. And in Chapter 10 (laughs) of your book, you address the idea of preparing for an epidemic. However, the book was published in February before COVID hit her shores. So what prompted you to write a book on this subject area? (laughs) Yeah, well, it was definitely not because I thought there was an epidemic coming. And obviously, I wish there hadn't been. (laughs) Um, I was just very um, struck that people kept asking me questions about the future. And I didn't know why they were asking me. So they would ask me, you know, what's going to happen in the Brexit referendum? Or, you know, is Trump going to win the presidential election and things like that? And I thought, why do you think I know? Nobody knows. And I felt that really a lot of people had a very magical belief about the future which was that it was somehow already out there somewhere, kind of behind a curtain, like in Wizard of Oz. And that if you were terribly clever or you knew the right people, you might be able to sneak a peek behind the curtain. And in fact, what's the case is the future is unknowable because it hasn't happened yet. And once you accept that it's so unpredictable, and I have to say, you know, now I think this is a much easier argument to win than it was when I started writing the book. Once you accept the future is unknowable and that there are huge limits to what we can predict with any kind of accuracy, that kind of frees you up to start thinking instead and asking a better question, which is, what do we want the future to be? And what likely threats do we think we see and where they might have a huge impact? What can we do right now to get ahead of that problem? This is very clearly what we should have, could have been doing to address climate change for the last 30 years. And, um, you know, my book talks about epidemics in part because in 2017, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness did start working on this problem because they were so alarmed by the degree to which governments had, had completely stopped paying attention. And, you know, one of the vaccines that's come out in the last year, the Moderna vaccine, stems directly from the coalition's initiatives when they saw that, you know, most pharma companies weren't going to start working ahead of time on vaccines for things that might never happen. And so they themselves started investing in vaccine development platforms. So, you know, the argument of the book is if you don't know the future, but you think there are some things which are likely that would have a huge impact, you have got to move ahead of the problem. And Margaret, of course, with the complexity of modern life, experts in forecasting are reluctant to look any more than 400 days out. But if we look at the root cause of this problem, why are we so addicted to prediction? I think we're addicted to prediction, however spurious it might be, because not knowing the future makes us very anxious. And we like to think, and I think this is quite a childish belief myself, we like to think, well, somebody knows, and if they know, then they'll tell us, and if they tell us, then I can stop worrying about it. And I think what's actually more energizing and more creative is to think, okay, if we don't know, then we have to start thinking about where do we want our country to go, or where do I want my career to go? And instead of thinking that we can outsource this most fundamental of questions, we start rolling up our sleeves and answering it for ourselves. And that's how we get the kind of society or we get the kind of career that we actually want instead of waiting for somebody else to hijack the whole thing and then dump us into worlds or careers we absolutely do not want. Talk to us about some of the projects and experiments which you highlight in your book that would never have been planned in the way in which they actually came to fruition. Yeah. Well, there's one, one of my favourite stories, which is about a woman who was a, a camera operator for the BBC's Natural History Unit. And in doing that work, she saw just garbage and plastic all over the oceans. This was in 2006. And... Um, and she thought it was horrible and she was distressed by it and she wanted you know, the future to be a place of clean oceans and sustainable marine life. And you know, she could have looked for predictions about what was going to happen, but nobody was particularly looking at it. And she thought, well, instead of waiting to figure out what's going to happen, I'll, I'll just see if I can stop this behavior. 
And the first thing she did is she made a searing documentary on the subject, which went out in 2007. And, you know, thinking, well, now people really change their minds. And they absolutely did not. You know, they kind of watched the film, put the kettle on, had a cup of tea and watched the next program. And she was heartbroken, but she didn't give up. So she thought, well, if I can't do something on a national stage, I'll do something really, really super local. And she persuaded her village to give up using plastic carrier bags. And she thought she really had no hope except to see, well, how could you get people to change their behavior? And let's try to do an experiment on a really small scale. And what she found was that when she explained the problem and part of the solution to people, they were very willing to change their behavior. But then much more to her surprise, the whole world media turned up on her doorstep. And within a month, whole provinces from China had banned single-use plastic bags. Um, you know, and this is a province of 30 million people. I think actually the Irish government followed suit quite soon thereafter. The British government was quite slow and the American government has been unbelievably slow. But overall, this has provoked a global change. But you don't know that the way to start this movement you can't predict that the way to start this movement is by starting in a little Devon village. The only thing you know is if you don't try things, nothing will change. And if your first experiment doesn't work, you keep going. Okay, so in your opinion, experimentation is key. But how can businesses set out on that path? Well, it's interesting. I mean, one, you know, I wrote about uh, uh, the chief data officer at the Bank of England who realizing there's going to be more and more data and more and more requirement to analyze the data and was enough of a grown-up to know nobody was going to give him any extra resources, you know, asked his entire workforce, you know, this is the problem. Where do you think there are pockets of, uh, you know, all of our processes where we could really improve our productivity? And he got all sorts of ideas from everybody, everything from changing the management meetings to changing the annual review process to changing how you tag the data, you know, all sorts of things. So engineering solutions, management solutions, strategy solutions. And they tried dozens of these. And, of course, what they found was that there were very different ways to work, which were much more appropriate to the new world in which we operate and which gave people a lot more sense of kind of possibility and involvement in the way that work got done in their department and energized people. And so productivity increased enormously. But none of these, he said, would would have been identified if he'd done what traditional management could do, which is kind of go away to a swanky hotel for a weekend, do a restructure, impose it on people who weren't consulted, and then just pray that it works. So involving more of the workforce allowed much more of the collective intelligence in the workforce really to work the problem. So in terms of navigating the future effectively, Margaret, what tools do people need to face the future with confidence and courage? Well, I think, first of all, you know, they need to consider the degree to which what their future is, what the future of their family, of their careers is, that's their decision and be very wary of people or technology telling you who and what you are. Um, You know, there's a huge fad at the moment for these psychometric tests that will tell you, you know, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. Um, And I've tried lots of these and every time I do them, apparently I'm a completely different person. So that's a little strange. I mean, I'm not aware that I suffer from multiple personality disorder, you know, (laughs) but these things, many of them have no statistical uh, validity. But what the psychologists tell us is that people believe these things. And if you say something to somebody about themselves and say, oh, you're such and such, they tend to believe that whether it's true or not, which is why astrology works, right? Because people just sort of, they fit what they are themselves to what they've just been told. So the first thing I would say is don't believe what all of these, you know, quizzes and tricks and profiles tell you about yourself. Think much more strongly, clearly about who do I think I am? What do I want to be? What kind of life do I want? Own your own life. 
don't let other people steal it. Think about what are the concerns you have and how you move to address those. And for, you know, people running governments and organizations, listen to the people around you. You know, one of the great experiments I write about in my book is about the citizens' assemblies which you've held in your country, which I think are absolute models of outstanding means of advising government and making recommendations. And one reason they're so great is because they absolutely use the full breadth of people's experiences, lived experience, and their capacity to learn and to collaborate. And this is so much richer and has so much more creative content in it than these kind of cheap and easy fixes that many companies and technologists try to sell us. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Professor Margaret Heffernan, and I'd like to thank Margaret for showing us how to survive in uncharted waters. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.